When I mention neurofeedback around people who are not that familiar with it, they often struggle to understand sort of how it actually happens as well. So I would love also a breakdown and maybe an example of what it actually looks like to do neurofeedback training as well. Biofeedback is a form of modifying the body essentially by taking things that are not normally uh, um, appreciable, like your heartbeat, your body temperature, and making them under your voluntary awareness so you can then learn to like change them. And this is something like HRV biofeedback, like the heart math devices or old school stuff like hand warming to drop headaches is biofeedback. You can look at your activation level and stress level and do some breath work and change that as a way of doing some biofeedback. Um, but generally when we say the word biofeedback, what we mean is peripheral nervous system control, things that are outside the skeletal system, you know, the controlling your heart, maybe your skin, your, your parasympathetic to sympathetic activation is, is biofeedback in the body. Neurofeedback is a form of biofeedback that has some unique properties. Um, by definition, it's just stuff that's on the central nervous system. So stuff inside the bone, you know, the skull and the spine, that's the CNS. And because it's the CNS, you're not really aware of it the same way you are in the peripheral body. So neurofeedback is measuring the brain usually and training it to change, but the process of change becomes involuntary operant conditioning or, um, or involuntary shaping. So this is how it actually works. And I'll give you a, a concrete example. Let's say you wanted better executive function. You wanted to control your distractibility better, uh, which we all, you know, many of us want to do. Some of us have ADHD, some of us don't, but many of us could benefit from some resource uh, building in the distractibility way. There's a brainwave called SMR, sensory motor rhythm, which is a low beta brainwave. And if any of you have seen a cat lying on a windowsill watching a bird, you've seen SMR. It's this liquid, still body and laser-like focus. That cat seeing a prey animal outside. Maybe it's the tail is twitching, but the body is just still. Mostly because you can leap onto an animal, you can, you can, you can leap into action from relaxation much, much better than from tension. So that mixed state of still body and focused mind is a high SMR state. And mammals, most animals make SMR as a way to inhibit, if you will, or to stop things from happening. If you have poor SMR tone, your brain tends to make seizures. And neurofeedback was discovered by mistake in the late 60s by Dr. Barry Sturman. So Dr. Barry Sturman was at UCLA in the, in the 50s and 60s, and uh, he's still an emeritus faculty. He's, he's still occasionally doing lectures, but he was exposing cats to rocket fuel vapors on request of NASA to figure out how dangerous this stuff was, this methyl hydrazine, because the astronauts were not enjoying breathing in vapors when they were exposed to it. So there was a research study and now in the 60s, we had much more lax animal uh, research. So this is the part of the story that's hard, but Dr. Sturman found that minutes exposed to the vapor would create increased symptoms where they would have uh, vocalizations, they would pant, they would drool, become unsteady in their gait and you know, ataxic, have seizure, then coma, then death. And it was a perfect dose dependent curve where minutes equaled symptoms, more, more and more symptoms. For 24 of the 32 cats he had in his little subject pool, eight of them, super cats, refused to have seizures. While the other cats were falling over and having major problems at about 40, 50 minutes in, the other cats were showing mild instability events in the brain two and a half hours exposed. Couldn't figure out why one group of cats seemed very different than the others. And then he remembered that these cats had been used in a prior experiment six months before to see if he could get them to raise this brainwave the cats make a lot of whenever he squirted chicken broth into their mouth to applaud it happening. And he could, they raised it, great. Back in the subject pool. Well, this brainwave makes your brain resistant to being destabilized, it turns out. And later on, he stumbled across this by mistake. And then his lab manager was a medication uncontrolled epileptic. And they built her an auditory feedback machine beeped whenever her SMR went up. And over the next few months, they trained her SMR up and she was on huge meds and having lots of seizures. And they eventually went off all her meds, remained seizure free for a year. So this was the start of the field of neurofeedback clinically, so to speak, in the late sixties. And we still train this SMR frequency. And now we often train it for things like ADHD as well as seizures, but um, is the cat in a windowsill, still body and laser-like focus is the opposite of ADHD, literally. High SMR, low theta is anti-ADHD state. When that reverses, high theta means like air in the brake lines and low SMR, so poor inhibitory tone. You're moving a lot, distractible, your brain's like squirrel. You know, it's very outside world reactive and it's not 
focused on the goal. So literally that calm cat is the opposite of an ADHD state. If you stick a wire in the part of the brain, which is involved with monitoring if you're paying attention and measure SMR and measure theta, which is a release state in some ways, as they change moment to moment, as your SMR happens to go up and the SMR, hap sorry, the theta happens to go down, you just applaud the brain and say, yeah, good job, brain, and make a little game on the screen move. So your Pac-Man eats some more dots or your puzzle pieces start to fill in or your spaceship starts to fly better. And a couple seconds later, your brain moves in the wrong direction for the workout. Your SMR goes down, your theta goes back up and the software slows down. The Pac-Man stalls, the beeps go away. And the brain's like, hey, I, I was watching stuff. I don't like no stuff. Where's the stuff? And then a couple seconds later, it happens to move in the right direction and the software resumes. Good job, brain, good job, brain, nope. Good job, good job, good job. Nope, again and again. And the big trick here is every few seconds we move the goalposts. So over half an hour sitting there, your brain gets little bursts of applause for runs or trends it engages in of reducing its theta and raising its SMR. And the mind can't feel its brain waves. That's why it's so mysterious and no one knows how it works if, you know, as they do it, because the mind can't tell that the computer game was happening only when a certain, you know, if you always moved your arm and the game always moved, you'd know what it was doing. But it's moving, your, whenever your theta moves, it moves or something, or beta moves, it moves. So your brain, however, likes the information and has no idea it's not a real thing in the world, like a musical instrument or a car you're trying to drive. And you're changing the rules. So it's trying to adapt a little bit as you go in that half an hour session. And usually after about three sessions or four sessions, Later on that day or the next day, your brain reaches for the state and says, hey, wait, I want information, We're low theta, high, high SMR. And the person goes, oh, I feel calm. And if you ask your kid to take the trash out when that happens, they get up and do it. And I get frantic calls. My kid took the trash out. I asked once. It was weird or whatever. You know, like you get, you get weird, subtle effects showing up and the process of getting the change in neurofeedback becomes one like personal training where you sort of look at your brain on an assessment, pick some goals, start gently working the resources out in this involuntary exercise way. But then you report the next day or later that day, how was your sleep? How was your stress? How was your attention? How was your drinking? How's your trauma? And you get effects. So it's mysterious, but not a blind process for you. And after, you know, as you try different things, you feel different things, you know, beta on this side produces more self-control, beta on this side produces more alertness. So if you come in and say, oh, I was super charged up and I could focus all night, but couldn't fall asleep. I might do some, you know, different beta wave for you and say, how was that? Oh, it's great. I could focus and I could fall asleep. Okay, great. That's your workout there. Let's do that a few times. And then it builds up and becomes more stable as you experience it again. So it's involuntary exercise on brainwaves using operant conditioning or shaping like Skinner's pigeons. You know, I promise this is not Pavlov's dog. I will not make you drool. But we take things that already exist, you know, brainwaves, and we shape them a little bit like Pavlov did with his pigeons. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people.